Welcome again. Right now we're at Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 38, the Lord's Supper. So uh, let's get right into this. This is Luke chapter 22, verse 14. Remember, we just came from uh, Jesus saying, you know, Let's, we're going to eat the Passover, prepare, prepare to eat the Passover. You know, are you going to go to this place? There's going to be an upper room and tell, tell the, the owner of the place that uh, the rabbi is coming with his disciples and they're going to eat the Passover. Okay, so let's start with that. In that context, verse 14. When the hour had come, he sat down with the 12 apostles. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I'm going to stop there because it's so very clear that the Lord's Supper is the Passover. Okay? There, again, there are people who argue that say, no, it wasn't the Passover. You know, Jesus didn't eat the Passover. Uh, no, it's very clear. Jesus told his disciples, Prepare to, to eat the Passover. You're going to go. You're going to find this, this, this place. You're going to tell the owner of the place that the rabbi is coming with his, with his disciples to eat, a pass, to, to eat the Passover. And, and then we got right here. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover. Okay. So he's sitting right there at the, pa at the table. They've got the Passover prepared at this time. And Jesus is basically saying, hey, I, I have looked forward to this for, for a long time. Okay, let's read again. Verse 15. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will no longer by any means eat of it until it is fulfilled in God's kingdom. He received a cup and when he had given thanks... May I add, I believe he probably gave thanks in the same traditional way as all Jews give thanks. He said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, I will not drink at all again from the fruit of the vine until God's kingdom comes. You got to remember, we're reading a story here of a Jewish rabbi with his disciples. Now, I want to bring another point to your attention here that I know a lot of people, a lot of Christians think that, you know, that Jesus was just some, this, some, like, almost like this cool, hippie guy, kind of guy that just came on the scene and gathered together 12 disciples. It's kind of like something that was like a cool thing you never heard of before. It's like, you know, he's just kind of like starting some kind of revolution. Do you know that every rabbi has got disciples? And in those days, you know, every different rabbi had their own group of disciples. So the fact that Jesus had disciples was nothing new, nothing new at all. The fact that Jesus was a rabbi and that he chose his disciples, that was nothing new. That was just what happened. That's just how they did things. And so it says here, when he received the cup, he had, you know, uh, when he had given thanks, then he said, take this and share it among yourselves. So again, this is a Jewish rabbi here, okay? How do you think he gave thanks? I'm sure he didn't give thanks like the typical Christians do today. I'm sure it was the same way as any, you know, full, you know, Jewish rabbi would ever give thanks, you know, the same kind of way. Uh, at least similar to what they do today. I mean, today they, they would say something like, you know, Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Alam, Borei Prihagafen, Amen. Like this kind of stuff. So, according to all the evidence that we have before us, Jesus gave thanks at least in a similar way to that, if not exactly like that, okay? So, uh, next time you have uh, communion... You should give thanks like that. You should give thanks like that. You should you should sing the blessing as any Jewish rabbi would sing, as any Jew would would sing. Okay. So he said Jesus also made it very clear that he will not drink of it. Okay, and this is a very important clue as well. This is a very uh, uh, I would say is a very overlooked clue. A lot of people have overlooked this. In fact, in all of my life, I've never heard anybody teach about this. But um, 
we have historical accounts, you know, extra biblical historical accounts of how Jesus looked physically. Okay, and one of the things that they said it says in in the historical documents is that Jesus had long hair. Now, that's a clue. Another clue is is that Jesus had um, uh, Jesus did not drink of the fruit of the vine. Okay, so for those of you who are a little bit more versed in the scriptures, what do those clues point to? Okay. For those of you who are not aware of it, there is uh, a vow in, in the book of Numbers, and it's uh, known as the Nazarite vow. Uh, Nazarite meaning uh, separated, set apart, like extra holy. Like Basically, in, uh, in, the, in the Torah, we have different levels of holiness, okay? First of all, you know, you, there's... Um, if you're not even obeying Torah at all, you're like you're like the outcast. You're like you're like the uh, what you might call the uh, the Gentile. But then if you're obeying Torah, that's one thing. That's fine. You've got your foot in the door, so to speak. But then there's an extra level of holiness that you can attain to. This is what they call the Nazarite vow. And for the most part, this is kind of optional. You can take the Nazarite vow for any period of time. You know, you can you can take the Nazarite vow for you know a week, a month, or a year, and basically one of the stipulations of that vow, actually a few of the different stipulations of that vow, is that you grow your hair, that men would grow their hair, and that they would not touch of the fruit of the vine. Now, Jesus being the Word in the flesh, the Word of God in the flesh, according to John chapter one, he's the fulfillment of the entire Word of God. Okay, he is the living breathing, walking, talking Torah, okay? So why would he not fulfill the, the Nazarite um, vow? We got here clues that, that tell us that he probably did take the Nazarite vow. We got the clue that historical documents that he had long hair. That's one clue. Another one is that he did not drink of the fruit of the vine. Now, I know that the, Phar- the Pharisees accused him of being a wine member. Remember, this is just an accusation. Remember, this is an accusation from the enemies of the Lord. This is not uh, the true uh, facts, you might say. This is this is an accusation from the enemies of the Lord. Do you believe in accusation? You shouldn't believe in accusation. We have no proof that Jesus was a wine bibber or a glutton for that matter. Okay, so uh, there's no evidence whatsoever that that Jesus ever drank even grape juice, let alone you know wine, so to speak. And by the way. In the manuscripts, there is no different. There, we don't have different words for uh, grape juice and wine. It's all the same thing. Grape juice is wine. Wine, and you know, just um, whether or not there's alcoholic content in there is just depending on the age of it. Okay, and so uh, you, you know, a lot of people would say that oh, there's wine, drinking wine in the New Testament. Well, you know what? Um, how do you know that's not talking about grape juice? How do you know? Um, but anyway, that's a totally different subject all by itself. However, we don't have any evidence that Jesus even sipped grape juice, let alone wine. Okay. Uh, right here, he said very clearly that he, uh, will not drink of the fruit of the vine until God's kingdom comes. Why would he say that unless he's under the Nazarite vow? Okay. Very, very important to understand this. Because, you see, Samson was under the Nazarite vow. Um, you know, John the Baptist was. Why not Jesus? I mean, it's the extra step of holiness. Why would he not take the extra step of holiness? Isn't he the most holy man that ever lived? Let's read on here. Verse 19. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. If this is the Passover... You know, he would have given thanks for the bread as, you know, all Jewish people do. Um, Remember, Jesus was a Jew, uh, a rabbi at at that. And uh, so even, uh, you know, Jews today, you know, if they don't do it daily, they would do it weekly at Shabbat. They would give thanks for bread, you know, in the same sort of way. You know, Baruch Atadonai Eloheinu Melech Halam Amotzi Lechem Min Aretz Amen. Okay. So they would they would give thanks like that, you know. I believe, based upon the fact that Jesus was a Jew and that he was a rabbi, he would have done something similar to that, if not exactly like that, okay? 
So he would have given thanks like that. And, and, uh, but the only thing is now, after he gave thanks for the bread, and again, this is not leavened bread, God forbid. I've, you know, I've seen Christians in their, you know, communions where they hand out, you know, little, little cubes of leavened bread. That is like blasphemy. That is something that you will never, ever do. Never, ever have le- uh, leaven, yeast in, 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 uh, in any kind of bread like that, a holy, uh, in a holy ceremony like that, never. Because yeast stands for uh, pride, which is sin, okay? Uh, very, very, uh, in, you know, very, very important to understand that yeast uh, for these, especially for a feast like this, um, a meal like this, the Passover meal or the Lord's Supper was absolutely, strictly forbidden. That goes to show how a lot of people today uh, have sin in their life, you know. Um, they even eat the, uh, the Lord's Supper with, uh, with yeast in it, and that's just absolutely, absolutely horrific. Um, but anyway, so the thing that Jesus did differently here is that he said, this is my body given for you. Do it in memory of me. So he was making it clear. He wasn't adding to the Torah. He wasn't adding to the Passover. He was just clarifying what it really meant. This is my body, which, which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. And keeping in mind the things uh, that, that what we're doing here just all symbolizes Yeshua, Jesus. Verse 20. Likewise, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, I'm going to stop here for a second again. This is very, very important to understand. The word new here in the original Greek manuscripts is not naos, okay? It doesn't mean brand new. It's like when Jesus said, you know, this, I I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. It's the same Greek word that's used, new commandment, new covenant, New Testament, new, new Commandment, new, new Testament, New Covenant. It's the same word. It doesn't mean brand new, as in it never existed before. It means refreshed, renewed, okay? And this is, we see this very clearly when Jesus said, I give you a new commandment. And he uses the same Greek word as what's here, that you love one another. Well, if anybody knows, you know, the Torah, the books of Moses, the, you know, uh, uh, the laws that we have of God that is written in Scripture previous to the coming of Jesus, if anybody knew these things, they would know that that's clearly in Torah. That's clearly in the Torah to love one another. Okay? That's not a new commandment. When Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, he was saying, I'm refreshing this to you. I'm, bringing, I'm, making, this, I'm making this new to you. I'm, 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 I'm refurbishing it for you, so to speak. I'm renewing it to your mind right now. I'm renewing it to your life. You know, I'm applying it to your life in a, in a fresh sense. This is a new commandment. This is in the same way he said this is a new covenant, which doesn't mean a brand new covenant that never existed before. No, this is a, this is a refreshed, renewed, applied, applied to you in a fresh way. Okay. New covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Verse 21. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. Ooh. Mm. Verse 22, the son of man indeed goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man. Who do you think he's talking about? Who do you think he's referring to? About, uh, referring to? Woe to that man. Of course, it's Judas. Woe to that man through whom he is betrayed. Woe is not blessing, my friend. Woe is the opposite of blessing, okay? Woe is a curse, Okay. Jesus didn't go around blessing everybody, hugging trees and, and you know, uh, petting flies or something like that. I mean, he didn't go around, uh, you know, as this extra hyper nice kind of hippie, okay? No, not at all. He condemned individuals. He condemned groups of people. He condemned even cities, entire cities. Condemned, cursed. Verse 23. They began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. Who would betray the Son of God? Who that's sitting at the table with him, eating this most important, the Last Supper? Who would do such a thing? These are all his best friends, so to speak. Who would do such a thing? Verse 24, A dispute also arose among them, which of them was considered to be the greatest? 
And this time Jesus spoke up. He said to them, the kings of the nations lorded over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. But the one who is the greater among you, let him become as the younger, and one who is governing as one who serves. For who is greater, one who sits at the table or one who serves? Isn't it he who sits at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials. I confer on you a kingdom, even as my father conferred on me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. You will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Here's a good one. You know, a lot of people say today, oh, let God be judged. God is the judge, not me. God's the... Hey, listen, Jesus, even Jesus didn't say, I'm the judge, not you guys. You guys just preach the word. You don't judge anybody, okay? He said to the, his disciples, you guys are the judges. You're going to be judging all of the nation. You're going to be on... You're going to be on the thrones. You're going to be on, you're going to be behind the, you're going to be on the bench. Okay. You're going to be judging the nation. In fact, in the book of Corinthians, Paul even takes it a step further than that. He said, every true Christian will judge the world. They will sit on the judgment seat. You know, when the time comes, if you're a true Christian, God is going to say, okay, here's your court over here. You're in charge. You are the judge. I'm going to pass before you a million people and you're going to judge every one of them. By the way, you're the judge. Far cry from what we hear today. Oh, God's the judge. You know, all I do is I'm just the messenger. I don't judge anybody. We're not supposed to judge. That's a lie. That is a deception. That is an infiltration of weakness. Don't fall for it. Verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan asked to have all of you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail. You, when once you have turned again, establish your brothers. Now, the word for brothers here is, can also be translated siblings or sisters, this kind of thing as well. Verse 33, he said to them, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And so he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will by no means crow today until you deny you know me three times. Verse 35, he said to them, when I sent you out without a purse, wallet, and sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. Then he said to them, but now whoever has a purse, let him take it. And likewise a wallet. Whoever has none, let him sell his cloak and buy a sword. Now, why did Jesus say this? Because, you know, back in those days when he said, don't take a purse with you, don't take a wallet, you know, um, because they were on a mission, they were in, they were on a roll. They were going from house to house, preaching the gospel. They, the way they would work back in those days is they would go, you know, to a, to, a diff, to a certain city, they would find out who uh, is a good person to stay with. They would go to that house. They would say, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so. This is where I'm from. You know, could I stay at your house? I'll work, you know, I, uh, I'll do some of the work in the fields for you. I'll work in, in the barn. I'll, I'll work for you. And uh, in return, you just, uh, if you can just uh, put me up, you know, for a few days. Um, you know, give me uh, uh, food and shelter and I will work for you. And that's how they did it. That's how Jesus and his disciples went from place to place. But Jesus knew the time was up. Time was up. The end is here. Uh, he, he's facing death. So that's why he said, you know, you remember when I said, take a purse, take, you know, or don't take a purse, don't take a wallet. Well, now you need to, because now you're not going to be, you're not going to be staying, you're not going to be going around. It's not going to be that kind of freedom anymore because they're after me now. And, and my time has come. Okay, so that session, the whole session of touring is over with. Okay, Th verse 37, for I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me. He was counted with the transgressors. This is Isaiah 53 verse 12. For that which concerns me has an end. 
Verse 38, they said, Lord, behold, we, here are two swords. He said to them, that's enough. Now, I find it very intriguing that Jesus here in this particular gospel, it's recorded that Jesus basically encouraged them to take swords. But when, you know, in another gospel, when Peter used that sword to cut out, and he cut off the, serv- the servant's ear, high priest's servant's ear, Jesus rebuked Peter for having that sword, saying, you know, we're not supposed to live, you know, whoever lives by the sword will die by the sword. So put it down. It seems like now in the, in the life of Jesus, confusion is kind of setting in. He's getting anxious. He's getting, and he's, he's on edge, okay? So lots of stuff to think about, lots of stuff to, you know, think about as you go through your day. So I encourage you, once again, always meditate upon the scriptures. Think about what the Bible says. You know, open the Bible for yourself. Read it. Get into it. Devour it. I mean, just get it into you. Memorize it. And seek God. And if you do, if you do with all your heart, you will find him. And I tell you, there's no no greater treasure than to find him. God. Okay. And uh, a lot of people have, you know, a lot of people think that they have found God and they didn't, they didn't find God. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. What does he mean? You know, if someone really found God, sin would be far from them. If they really found God, the fear of God would be in them. And uh, if the fear of God's in them, they would hate sin. It says in the scriptures, the fear of the Lord is to hate all evil. Evil not according to what you think evil is, but evil according to what God says evil is. So as you go your way, call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things and let him give you understanding and revelation beyond your imagination. In the name of Yeshua, be blessed. Thank you.